last winter. And I pitched that to an editor and then she was like, but there's already this piece about the dreams of the Nazi era. Why do somebody needs to read about dreams of Iranians? And I was like, it's like saying like, there's a love story about like 19th century French people, why anyone should write love stories anymore. That's astonishing. Yeah, that sounds like that's an editor comment. Yeah, it's already done. What what new thing are you offering? It was like, well, context, time, history. So what have you? What did you do with that piece? I didn't do actually anything with it. Oh, I, I'd love to see it. I wasn't able. I haven't yet been able to like frame it and be able to find my way into it. But I have the material. Um, I think she actually kind of like caused the energy to be deflated. Mm. Go back to it. We'll try to get it. We'll try to inflate it back. (laughs) Yeah. I'll ask you about that project. That sounds like a really good project, honestly. You just need to bug me about it. Yeah. I feel like both of us, uh, Jay, you and I also should just like go in the mode that Brandon is. I really like that visual aspect of like darkness. Your your visual screen is compelling. (laughs) Yeah. I think we can, we could probably get started because I think we're live at this point. Oh. Yeah. Welcome all for the reading this evening. Um, A friendly reminder that the chat is available if you um, are sure to type panelists and panelists and attendees. Those reading as well as those um, attending will be able to view and see the chat. Um, Today's reading or tonight's reading is a rescheduling from yesterday. I think it's important to note um, as a historical moment, um, I'll just contextualize that during the four years of the Civil War, the Confederates never got closer to Washington than Fort Stevens. That is until yesterday when insurrectionists paraded through the US Capitol building carrying the Confederate battle flag. Um, If we can remember and understand that history, the implications, consequences, Um, further lack of safety that that means for certain bodies in this particular country. Um, Tonight, we're going to be blessed to have the words, vision, and work of Pupe Misagi, Jay Ponteri, and Brandon Shimoda, who will be reading in that order. So I'll read bios and then transition to our readers. Starting with Pupe Misagi, who is a writer, a translator, both into and out of Persian, an editor and an educator. She holds a PhD in English and creative writing from the University of Denver, an MA in creative writing from Johns Hopkins University and an MA in translation studies. Her debut novel, Trans Relating House One was published by Coffee House Press in February, 2020. I highly recommend it. Um, Her nonfiction, fiction and translations have appeared in numerous journals and she has several books of translations published in Iran. I'll Be Strong For You, her translation of Iranian author Nassim Marashi's novel is forthcoming this spring, spring 2021. As an ed- editor, she worked for many years with Asymptote and is co-editor, co-editor of Matters of Feminist Practice from Belladonna Collaborative. Besides being a faculty mentor for PNCA, she is currently a visiting assistant professor at the Department of Writing at the Pratt Institute, Brooklyn, at the BFA and MFA levels, as well as a writing consultant at Baruch College, CUNY, New York. Please welcome, please share warm, warm, positive energy into the chat for Pupe Misagi. Thanks, Allison, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to actually read from a work in progress um, that is not even yet finished. Um, 
Uh, and I'm going to read um, from the opening pages. Um, to give you just some context, um, this is a novella. Um, it's going to be all monologue, um, hopefully all one paragraph. Um, and it's a woman who is giving a tour to this project that she has um, imagined, created, and brought to um, the world. Um, and while I read, you'll get a sense of what the project is and um, what she has done. I would also want like to provide content warning. Um, this work is about um, torture and interrogation. Um, so please feel free to step away or mute me if something is um, troubling. Okay, it's 9.05, okay. The Sound Museum. So let us begin with the basic facts. I really value transparency, unlike many of my colleagues, especially the male ones. As a female former torturer, recently retired, I realized not too long ago that the system was not doing a good job creating an archive of its achievements. Mind you, I'm proud of our system, but this pride has nothing to do with the bureaucracy or practical day-to-day -day aspects of the system or the way it documents its legacy, rather with the ideology behind it. And even more so, to be honest, with the spirit of power and the thirst for feeding the system, the thirst for feeding it, the thirst for it feeding the system. The spirit of power and control, and who would not want that, especially if you're a woman within a patriarchal system, right? I did my best in my later years as a senior member to shift the gender balance of our workforce and train and put to work more women. I have many success stories, especially with using women for interrogating the male prisoners who so full of themselves never thought a woman was manipulating their male ego to get what she needed to help support the goals of our system. But all that is to the side. Maybe I'll tell you about that aspect of my achievement later. Back to the main point. Unlike many dictatorial and totalitarian systems historically and across the globe, ours has not been doing a good job of documenting and archiving our interrogation and torture methods. What a loss, right? We've been doing such a great job for many years and people on both sides, both we within the administration and those upon whom the techniques have been used would agree with that. I'm sure many would testify to that if needed, or I guess I should say, if allowed. I began to notice at some point that even though most of the administrators and the directorial force shared the goal of bettering the system continuously, we ended up doing lots of trials and errors or repeating ourselves or past methods because of this lack of systematic scientific passing on of knowledge amongst ourselves. So I began taking notes after my own sessions or while observing sessions led by younger team members for whom I was the supervisor or talking to colleagues during our breaks or our rare shared meals or outings for side undercover projects. Those colleagues, of course, who did not mind sharing their knowledge. Yes, bragging they all do, but really looking at what they, what they were doing to understand the patterns and trends and else, or being willing to share their experience in order to teach someone else something, no, that's not a thing, at least based on what I've seen. Though I wonder whether that too has some gender issues behind it, the male superiors not wanting the women to know their secrets of success. Though I've seen enough of that behavior amongst groups of male colleagues as well. So I talked to those who were willing to be more observant and then pass on small bits and pieces of their knowledge. I began with these unofficial procedures and then my interest began to grow. We definitely had learned and continued to learn from our coworkers around the world, though I'm aware that each country, era, situation, or even type of prisoner demands their own set of rules and regulations, but still we all learn from one another. We are in the age of globalization after all, though I think with regard to torture, we have always been globalized based on what I've read about it over the years. 
Anyway, at some point I realized we needed a museum, a kind of archive museum learning center. And I made it my personal goal to be the leading figure pushing for this and making it happen. I will tell you later about how fucking hard it was to persuade my superiors, all of them with their fucking male egos, even I whom they respected for all the years of my hard work and innovative methods I had brought in with my high rates of success that I could be the one leading this task force, but succeed I did. A budget was set aside, though a small one in the beginning, and they only allowed me to work on it by myself in the preliminary research phase of the project. That was good enough to begin with. But as I took more and more notes and went through my notes, I realized that would not be enough. I found within me a growing curiosity to learn the theory, history, and critical mindset behind what I had practiced for so many years. I think part of this had to do also with the desire as part of this project to change the widely popular perspective that we, the torturers, were just the practical hand of greater minds and not necessarily smart people ourselves. Imagine that. How could we not be smart people? Don't they know the level of mental pressure and subtle decision-making it takes for us to navigate each and every interrogation and torture session? It really surprises me the things people presume. I guess this is a problem generally, each group of people imagining they are the only smart ones, the only ones understanding the ins and outs of the world we live in or our humanness. The more I continued with my research, the more, the more I realized how we as a profession have been using the knowledge of other professions to aid us through our job, from those in various physical medical fields to those in psychology and psychoanalysis, from tech geniuses to those running factories and industries, from military personnel to of course more traditional detectives, from novelists and artists to even parents, if you can believe that, to just give you a few examples. And at some point I realized that I was getting more and more interested in not just documenting what we were doing, but providing a larger contextual framework or even a critical manual for our profession, a profession feared but also fantasized by many people. As a result, I decided I needed to put together a research group, even a small one, to help me create the archive and research foundation on the topic. The project was just getting bigger and bigger every day. I knew as smart and capable that I was, I would not be able to bring to life the vision I had for the project and the museum without the help of a capable, trustworthy team who would also make sure to keep it confidential while the project was still underway. I didn't want to set any expectations, and I also didn't want anyone to beat us to it, mainly external enemy forces. I saw this not only as a personal project, but also a national one. This doesn't in any way contradict the globalization that I mentioned earlier. Even in the age of interconnectedness, we still need to hold on to our national glory and make sure foreign forces are aware of our achievements in all areas, but mainly in this one that I'm concerned about. It took a while to find the reliable personnel I was looking for, and I'm very proud of the I'm very proud of the all-female team I put together and what we have achieved. This is going to be changing the way things are done in our police and prison system, I assure you. And I want to make sure that the credit goes to everyone in my team. The original idea, however, for the museum, I'm more than happy to take credit for. What I noticed throughout observations of my own sessions and supervising the younger interrogator torturers in my team was that what we all mainly paid attention to were visual cues. Most people believed that for proper documentation to happen, we needed to take pictures, which are of course these days much easier to take because we are always carrying our phones with us, many of us, at least two of them, one for our personal and family lives and the others for our professional lives, which for a large percentage of us entailed also alias names, for many of us that being the one we had gained our reputations under. Pictures and also videos, which can, I agree, provide a holistic documentation of everything that happens in the interrogation room. Besides the images, the other thing that seems to matter is content, what is drawn out of the prisoner, 
despite the fact that the information they provide, I should clarify here, doesn't matter most of the times. Within our system, unlike many others where the information really matters, we only sometimes torture for prisoners to confess and give us urgent information. We begin the process while we already know that the information is not worthy of our attention or time, that the prisoner hasn't really done anything that we want to know more about or has information about something that we ourselves don't already have or they know people they can rat out that we ourselves haven't already had under surveillance. That is all beside the point. We interrogate in order to put on a display of power to show the prisoner and the larger circle around them, whether it be their family members or friends or their professional colleagues and the larger society as well, that we can do as we wish to send a message to them, to show them that we have full control over not only their bodies, but also their internal, emotional, and psychological states. To show them that we can do as we please, which you wouldn't disagree with me, I'm sure, is such an amazing intoxicating feeling. As I was explaining, what I noticed was that for documentation purposes, most often my team members would pay attention to things like lighting of the room, the sitting or standing situation, temperature of the room, what we could do to the prisoner's skin or their skulls, body language, the way they would budge under different kinds of instruments we used and stuff like that. Meanwhile, the more I observed and jotted down information like this, the more I felt dissatisfied. I began to feel there was something amiss. I agreed that kind of information was useful, but somehow I felt it didn't go to the heart of the matter. It didn't seem to achieve the affect I was hoping my dream museum would have. I kept thinking about how the way we have presented our field to the public, they often remember having seen a torture equipment or objects from middle ages kept in museums here and there in the world or images of which, or, um, and there in the world, images of which abound on the internet. Or they have heard about interrogation techniques based on what I've heard from friends and family outside of this profession, mainly in the context of the American achievements post 9-11 and the Abu Ghraib prison. These anecdotes people recount interestingly focus on what the interrogation and torture system is doing or aiming to achieve. We, the torturers and the interrogators are the subjects and the focus, which just to clarify, I'm not against at all. What I'm saying is this is not what I felt interested in for the museum I was working on. I valued that for the research compendium to put together expansive material and methodology to hopefully leave behind a guideline for future generations. Um, I valued that for the research compendium to put together expansive material and methodology to hopefully leave behind a guideline for future generations. There's also already another kind of narrative present in what the general public have heard and remember of torture. And that is narratives offered by prisoners' memoirs sharing their memories of imprisonment, interrogation, and how they broke down or survived through it all. Again, I totally see why they are important, even to us, in the sense that they confirm our power and our uniqueness in the way we handle things. I kept collecting and asked my team to collect all types of survivors' memoirs beside the technical information of instruments and methods we have been using. To clarify here, I also want to make sure there is a well-detailed account of the process behind this project, where it began, the stages it went through, and how it came to fruition. Another point was, I wanted the project to not only be informative, but also creative, a unique way of approaching the topic. Be creative so that we can reimagine a new relationship to this industry, or I rather say to the arts and crafts of, the, of torture. One day I was looking at the artworks of this Iranian artist in exile, Siyah Armajani, who I think passed away just recently. And I came upon a piece called Sound Towers. Let me show you a picture. It might not look like anything special, but the concept and the title of the piece stayed with me. 
it's strange how we find inspiration in such odd places and how our innovation relies so heavily on a combination of our intuitive decisions, systematic investigations, and the bettering of the systems we work with, as well as on keeping ourselves open to synchronicities and what the world puts in front of us. The drawings provide frontal and back view of these towers Armajani imagined, accompanied with some notes underneath about how the sound is to be generated and the exact mathematical or geometrical, geometrical calculations for, this me for their measurements. I think at that time, I was already a few months into my preliminary research phase and it totally upended my idea about what to focus on. I don't know why I had not thought about it before, but that doesn't matter anymore. As the saying goes, you make a move and God offers you the blessing. What matters is the heavens offered me their gift on that day. It shifted the way I went into interrogation sessions after that. I began to develop this idea of focusing more and more on sound. Isn't sound the main premise of interrogation? Where would we be that? Where would we be without sound? Isn't language, regardless of whether it is uttered by the prisoner's voice or withheld within their throat, throat, throat um, what is at the core of the interrogation session? Without the voice and the role it plays, whether through its presence or absence, our work would lose all its meaning. So why not just focus on that aspect for our museum and make the audience interact with the records of the sessions through the sole medium of sound. But I was not really interested in what was being said. I was invested in how it was being said or not said in the affect of the interrogation on the body of the prisoner and expressions of that affect through sound. Have you heard about that restaurant where you eat in total darkness? I know, one of those first world bourgeois offerings, but interesting nonetheless. And as I noted, I'm all in for taking inspiration from anything, anywhere. The idea is to help you get rid of sensory pollution and focus only on one sense, in the case of the restaurant, on your sense of taste, rather than all the drama around food, food decoration and presentation, restaurant ambiance and else. In our case, I wanted our audience not to be distracted by multiple aspects of the interrogation session and to be able to only hear the voice leaving the prisoner's body, letting it enter their own body and remain there. This idea, if you think about it, also totally makes sense in our day and age when we are faced with an overabundance of visual images about anything and everything, they being so readily available as well as the current time's obsession with the nature of information, it's being fact or fiction, true or false. My thinking was that, and the years long procedure has underlined this further, that the vow of information, such as who the prisoner is, the situation of their imprisonment, data about who we are and what we do, or without images from the interrogation room or the torture room, the relationship of the museum visitor would change toward a deeper, more embodied one. The goal wouldn't be for them to look out for information for what was being carried with and delivered through the voice of the interrogator torturer on the one hand and the prisoner on the other hand. They would instead only have the sound itself to hold on to. The sound itself, however, as you might have rightly guessed, is of two different natures. One is the sound that is devout of language that is altered by the body out, out of its own volition that is reactionary, which mind you is similar to the sounds, if you excuse my bluntness, the sounds we make or hear during sexual acts. The other type is, as I explained earlier, the voice that carries with it language, drawing our attention to it because it is saying something. And this, is, this one in and of itself again has two layers the pure acoustic quality and the language by which I mean the meaning being carried by that sound. In our experimentations, I grew more and more interested in the power of the latter type. And my team and I decided to, cur to curate the recorded and documented voices of pr prisoners under interrogation and during torture so as to bring attention first and foremost to the non-linguistic aspect of the sounds of interrogation and torture. 
I think this is genius because on that level, we can prove without directly telling this to the audience and without them necessarily realizing this on a conscious level that we have succeeded in pushing the human be beyond what makes them human, robbing them from the capability of producing language and expressing meaning through language. And I'll pause there. The Sound Museum. I really value transparency. All of them with their fucking male egos. How could we not be smart people? A display of power to send a message, to show them we can do what we please, to leave behind a guideline for future generations. Where would we be without sound? Have you heard about the restaurant where you eat in total darkness? the sounds we make or hear during sexual acts. Thank you so much, Pupe. Um, please feel free to share love, warmth, um, reflections into the chat for Pupe. All right, next we have um, Jay Ponteri, our director. <laughs> uh, Jay Ponteri directed the creative writing program at Merrill Hurst University for a decade from 2008 to 2018 and is the author of Dark Mouth Strikes Again and Wedlocked. Lobe is a forthcoming title from Widow and Orphan House in this summer, June, 2021. The recipient of the 2013 Oregon Book Award and the Frank Wat Waters Fellowship, Jay is also the founder of Show Tell, the workshop for teen artists and writers. Jay serves as an instructor at Literary Arts and on the advisory board of the Independent Publishing Resource Center, IPRC. Please welcome Jay. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, an awesome reading, Poupe. Um, so I'm just feeling um, really grateful to be in this community um, right now. And I just would like to thank everybody out there who's listening. Um, I am going to, I have a book called Loeb that's coming out. Loeb is sort of a form that I think I received. Um, and it's just large sprawling on paragraphs of text. Um, mainly um, describing whatever is kind of passing through me. So I don't consider it a stream of consciousness, but um, I think of it as close interior writing. Some of the pieces are actually um, kind of um, essays and the one I'm about to read is a letter. And um, it's the coda, it's the book's coda um, so I'm calling it Loba. And um, it started as a text message to my son, Oscar. So it's for him. Dear son. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I got ahead of myself. I wanted to share just a couple short sentences by Cecilia Vicuña and Atul Agnan. This is um, Cecilia Vicuña. Words want to speak. To listen to them is the first task. And then Atel Adnan. She's living, she's still with us. She's right now, she's living in Paris or France, um, Paris, France or somewhere outside of Paris. And I just am amazed um, that I get to be a writer when she is a writer and a painter. So what do we do in between besides eating oysters for dinner and going for walks and taking trains or flights and melting our eyes in the next horizon? This is a way of not giving up. Dear son, if you look down at your feet, will you see my pair of blue socks? If you see 
blue socks on your feet, you might actually be looking at my favorite pair of socks ever, which seems fitting, pun intended, because you are my favorite human being ever. Son, do you feel their perfect fit, that weave of fabric stretching and pressing in, not constricting, not loose, but flexible, a shapely garment revealing the curves of your ankles and feet, and that blue, a mid-blue, an azure, not dark or royal or baby, some cream mixed in to lighten without muting or softening. This blue of a sky of the sea's surface through which sunlight beams, numinous blue of the spirit world, all the invisible beings nudging in around us and speaking to us with their not words. Dear son, do you realize that your feet have become transmitters receiving dispatches, blue speckled sparkly floating matter from the netherworld flowing within, around and beyond us? Have you noticed your body's sudden lightness? Are you floating? Have you become a human hovercraft? Are you flying across the earth? Dear son, I'm missing you. I'm missing my blue socks. I'm not missing you wearing my blue socks because you're wearing my blue socks. Dear son, I believe in you. I believe in your being, all the ways you are loving, humble, courageous, silly, sardonic, guided often by curiosity. You are not a stranger to loss and the ensuing grief, to instances of zigzagging uncertainty along with attending forms of agitation. I witness you encountering the reality that so many humans don't quit violence. You allow the divided world to enter into your being and you sit with it, you run with it, you run through it. You're a long distance runner, dear son, a runner of growing distances. I'm so proud of you, whom you are, whom you're becoming. You're with your mom today. She has driven you to the coast for a cross country meet. You have become accustomed to our family structure, to switching between us, to moms, then to dads, what I call the two one structure, like a straight line that also exists within a ghostly triangle. The triangle exists and doesn't, flickers on and off. I'm here, we're texting each other. You're with your mom wearing my blue socks. Your mom will drive you to my place tomorrow. The triangle feels ghostly in that it exists also as a memory of the three of us sharing space time as a family intact, the continuous reshaping of the family archetype, parents holding each other, holding their child, a hold holding a hold. When you remember the three of us, you feel at the same time the ghost of the family whole and its break, what once existed and what no longer exists. We continue to process together and separately the pain from that break. Your mom and I transform our grief into a loving friendship between co-parents, exposing you to one among many ways love reforms itself, that reformation holding space for you to live your life without worrying about ours, space for you to individuate, to begin to know separate from us, all these emerging selves within you, to see and feel your multiple selves as distinct from how you know us and how you feel known by us. You are an actant, an action verb, a human being in motion within the comments, which is to say, your choice to wear my blue socks differs from mine, no longer a choice. Perhaps you're turning yourself into a sunlit swimming pool. That sun, the center of our solar system, a massive conflagration 
is a near perfect spear of hot plasma whose radiating energy keeps us alive. Perhaps you understand we are all bodies of the same water. That's Vicuña. Perhaps you understand the ghostly point of the triangle also exists as an extrapolation, a distinct familiar possibility, a point of actual connection. As you and your mom drive to the coast, you both know, can imagine me in my apartment with Mo the pug or at school or at the cafe. You know not only that I'm holding the two of you in my thoughts, but that I exist in it as an eventual destination, a space to which you return. You open the apartment door and you say, hello, and I answer back, hello. We locate ourselves by locating each other. Not exactly echolocation, but echolocution. Are you here? I'm right here. This perforated triangle existed long before our divorce, taking root within some fundamental decisions we made around raising you. Rather than being shuttled off to daycare we could not afford, you'd hang out with your mom in the mornings while I worked. At noon, I'd rush home, your mom and I passing each other as she rushed out the door, rushed out the door, and she'd work afternoons and evenings as you and I would walk the alleys of our, neighbor, of our neighborhood, play at Alberta Park, read books at the cafe, at home, I'd put on silly puppet shows with a dodo bird and squirrel. Or I'd affect this very deep voice and become Ranger Steve and read to you from a book about forest safety. Later, preschool years, I'd work jobs at which you could accompany me. My coworkers loved playing with you, brought toys for you, took photos of you, writing on the whiteboard or arranging pieces of your wooden tracks into a winding course. And if you weren't with me, they became disappointed, felt your absence as I feel your absence in this moment. Or absence is not exactly the right word because you're there, not with me, but within a discernible space, a home space at the edge of the rainforest by the sea, you and your mom eventually heading back to me, wearing my blue socks, Honestly, the best pair of socks I've ever owned. Dear son, do you know that I make specific plans to wear those blue socks? I don't wear them on Sundays because I tend not to see many people. I wear them on my busier days when I'm on campus or at the cafe, days I'm likely to interact with friends, colleagues, students, acquaintances, strangers. The moss at the base of the fir tree the liana curling down the trunk, the crows dropping down from the telephone lines at the, to the sidewalk. My wearing these socks becomes the gift I give to myself and to others, to the world connected through perforated cords revealing in shimmery tips the blue underworld, the blue underworld that flows around within, beyond. I don't need an altar to pray to the great Mexican poet, Sir Juana Inez de la Cruz, but if I could make one, I'd begin with the pair of blue socks on your feet, larger than mine. We don't own or wear this pair of blue socks. Dear son, that pair of blue socks wears the universe. About a month ago, your mom and I sat on a bench at Grant Park, watching you compete in a cross country race. We don't simply watch you, we witness you. Your presence in proximity situates our bodies to receive you. You steer us in your direction. We feel awe for you, how this with and apart echo each other, how with is apart and a part is with. Our attention is careful, precise, stretchy. When you run past us, we paused in our conversation to focus on your stride, your footfalls, your rapid breath. We haven't spoken about you or the three of us in a long while. 
your mom and I are in a phase of sharing very little other than you and not out of disappointment or anger, but love and respect for boundaries that have taken position in our lives as we have changed, largely separate from each other. I think of that Tom Petty line from the song, To Find a Friend, things change and then they change again. Your mom has settled into a relationship with her partner, and I want to communicate to them that their love can exist as a heart radiating out to those around them, you included, that I don't want her partner to feel on the outside of things. He's another person who gets to love you, dear son, whose love you get to feel. In other words, I don't wanna take up any undue space in your mom's life. We share you. Your mom and I sit on, sit on this park bench and you're running by as I tell her that I've been experiencing these forceful waves of grief over the loss of your childhood. The fact that you're leaving us for college in less than three years. These waves of grief rising through my chest into my lungs and throat and sucking up all the breath and language. And I feel paralyzed, chest punched, as if I were tilting over a precipice and my only release is to begin sobbing. I tell your mom about the incident a few weeks ago at a different park, Alberta Park, the very part to which I'd carry you strapped to my chest in the baby Bjorn to play. Later, we'd walk slowly together, holding hands, surmounting the curbs together. And later, I'd watch you run ahead to the street corner. The race had not yet started. I sat on a park bench next to the play structure and across from the swing set beneath these massive dug firs. Dappled sunlight moved in flashes over the knotty protuberances on the lower part of the trunk where branches had once sprouted and grew, then shed as the tree grew taller. I looked around for you. Your team hadn't arrived yet. We were meeting here, which is to say a vehicle separate from mine was taking you places. We were now arranging our own transport. Grief overtook me. After I sobbed, I felt not sad or angry, but incredulity and despair. Despair is sorrow walking up to the edge of that precipice over the fact that I was not, I was not standing at the play structure, arms outstretched, guiding you up the rope ladder or up the slide. You didn't want to slide down as much as walk up that we were not touching, that you were not a little boy discovering the world with such expansion, wonder, apprehension, playfulness, wildness of imagination and of curiosity, fear, the child who just wants to know how everything works. I was sitting alone on a park bench years later, not there guiding you across the footbridge from the slide to the rope ladder, not standing in wood chips and gravel, our pug dogs not leashed to a post next to me, baiting each other or barking at me to watch the boy child more closely or sniffing pee, a breeze not blowing your sandy blonde curls, me not thinking about whatever had to be done back at the house, maybe the ovens preheating for chicken tenders, bills spread out on the kitchen kitchen table I needed to pay before setting the table for dinner. The memory felt so physical, like a tree bough I could touch. It's right there and it's gone. The higher branches occlude the sunlight from the lower ones and the lower branches shed. You are with me, not with me. Those pug dogs have both died. Your mom and I are no longer married and you have grown into a young man. Your child's sense of wonder, your play and curiosity now commingle with adult self-consciousness, the anxiety of living in such an uncertain, violent space. Things break apart. Things are breaking apart. You live with this fact. After you run by us, your mom and I both notice your, your pace has sped. Your mom tells me that her grief experience 
similar to mine is also connected to the fact that once you leave for college, then distance would open up between her and me. If you're like a moving point between us, a line, she explains this to me. Two days here, then two days there. Once you leave, we will just be two dots existing, but not in connection. I feel surprised that your mom feels anticipatory grief over our future distance. Even though we remain friends and well-functioning co-parents, our relationship has clear boundaries in terms of what we share with each other. We don't share private intimate life. Our ordinary and extraordinary struggles, our emotional lives, all the interstices holding that day together. But looking at what we do share, I remind myself that we share so much, that early promise of our youthful love now come to fruition in ways you, we could never have imagined. And Amy's tearing up and I tell her that we will always be close, that you play a central part of our lives, you bring us together. Perhaps the source of our grief is that in the span of your entire life, we will only be a part of it that your lovers, your future family, your adult friends, your work will move into the center of your being, the dug fur conserving its nutrients for the boughs and needles, reaching towards the sunlight. Your mom and I are sitting on that bench. You're running somewhere beyond our pet perceptual field. And I begin to think, no, not think, I conjure up an image. As far as I can recall, as long as you've spoken, whenever you were deep in play, building cities, playing with trains, building Lego structures, that kind of thing, swinging beneath the tree in the backyard, playing video games, texting with friends. We'd call you for dinner and you heard us calling, but you wanted to stay in the fold, your verbness. And when you did set aside, let go of your play, you'd say, here I come, which of course we knew. We knew you were coming, understood the labyrinthine instance in which your play existed and the slippery instance in which our family dinner existed. We could feel you moving towards us. To this day, you still say these three words, here I come. You want us to know that you're here with us. And dear son, we know you're here with us. Thank you, I'm gonna end there, it goes on. Thanks so much for listening. If you look, will you see my pair of blue socks, which seems fitting pun intended not dark or royal or baby. Your feet have become transmitters. Have you become a human hovercraft to moms, then to dads, a ghostly triangle? You are with your mom wearing my blue socks, parents holding each other, holding their child. We locate ourselves by locating each other, this perforated triangle. Please continue to show Jay gratitude in the chat. We prepare for our final reader this evening, Brandon Shimoda. Um, Brandon Shimoda is the author of seven books of poetry and prose. Most recently, The Grave on the Wall, which is from City Lights, which I highly, highly recommend. Um, I turn often on page 90 is the sentence, the Peace Museum and the War Museum are the same museum. This book received the Penn Open Book Award. Um, Brandon's forthcoming book on the afterlife of Japanese American incarceration received a Whiting Award for creative nonfiction and will also be published by City Lights. In addition to PNCA's program, Brandon also teaches at Occidental College in Los Angeles and he resides or lives in Tucson, Arizona. Please show warmth and love to Brandon as he takes the virtual Zoom microphone. Is that me? Uh-huh. 
Thank you so much, Allison. Um, I can't imagine having a, a father who would write about me, Jay. Um, and certainly not so tenderly. Was Oscar listening to that? He's not in the other room. Um, very grateful to be sharing the screen with Allison and Pupe and Jay. They are breaking now. Their sounds not new. You have heard them. So familiar to you now, could you ever forget them not in your dreams? The consequences of the sound, the breaking. That's Teresa Hak Kyung Cha from Dicte. I have wanted to be a sieve. I have wanted to be an an echoic chamber and reflect back to you no sound, but for the quiet rush and thrum of your own nervous blood. That is Dao Strom from Instrument. Before the wind had a sound, before the moon had a name. And that is Alison C. Rollins from Free Radical. Um, I'm gonna read a poem in the spirit of uh, several of the readers that have come before me this week. Uh, this poem is not only in progress, Maybe that's what we have in common, but it might be a little chaotic. And then after I read the poem, I'm gonna read a series of dreams, transcriptions of dreams that I had um, any time between 2016 and uh, last night. The poem is called Happy New Year. I wrote a poem for the 20th year in a row. It was the same poem, so I thought I knew what I was doing. This time, though, the poem had a conductor like a host, a young child who invited me to write the poem in her house. Her house was covered in morning dove feathers and shit that she had not cleaned up. I don't know how, she said, and I don't have the time. I'm giving it to you, she said. The time, knowing how, the haze of morning doves, was it wealth? Could wealth be defined as anything carried over the threshold of night into day? The young child explained how I was going to write the poem. She presented it like a test. If the poem is hot or cold, is about something hot or cold, or about being hot or cold, you are required to make it hot or cold, she said, and so on. She gave me a long, narrow strip of yellow paper. Yellow like the mountains, she said. Yellow mountains are where? Where have I seen yellow mountains before? The paper was already torn. The young child was already gone, but I could hear feeding and could feel in my right shoulder something like candy but liquid turning into magma and ice simultaneously. I sat down among the feathers and shit and neither hot nor cold started writing. A shrine burned down, I wrote. A shrine burned down and was replaced with a shrine, identical but empty, but for the aura of a tree in the shape of smoke. Photographs of the dead once grimaced from the walls, the dead, a perfect instrument, were pitiful in their performance, could only scratch a simple shrine in a prism, a replica of a circumstance. Not even the mountain in the sun of which the shrine was once a complement seemed alive. I approached the altar, colorful with photographs of people I did not know, 
would never, but now I had seen them as real to me as people I see but do not talk to, are alive, loved, deserve to be visited. Strangers go all over the rainbow, never settle. Do not situate before the gaze of one particular stranger. The dead were not gazing, they wanted it to be over, their reflection to be stronger, like a lunar sound, materializing a hymn of thanksgiving to the missing. Living, the living are late, always clutching their face. What a place, faces, immunizations. Then it began to rain and did not stop. It stopped raining, then started again. The rain slid underneath the skin that held the people together. It rained for the span of each lifetime of everyone who was living here or found themselves living here or unable to live here any longer, but unable to leave. It began to rain six feet away from where it was not raining. The average citizen did not believe it because they could not see it, nor could they feel it. Feeling is a mode of distress and division through which a perversely sober person might pass like a sleepwalker through a curtain. Then a bell rang all night. It rang all night. No one slept, but listened to the bell. They were framed by empty urgency. No one could be saved by a dream. Everyone plunged into the least suggestive ether. The bell was murmuring at the surface of a lake like a fish demented by its dream of consciousness, which was a seam torn open. It was windy. The fence flew back and forth. The bell held to the world by a bookmark blank banging against the skin of its echoes. The bell stopped, was regrouping, the soul over the neighborhood crushed against the fibers of a nest, bled, bled into the riverbed, flailed and yet without supplication slipped out of the skin it blew against. Who is it? Who is at the gate? Who is at the door? Someone who is hungry, who wants me to be hungry? I put water on for tea for them. I wait for the water for them. Whose face is it in the steam? Is no water, no steam, no tea for them. No rest, no sleep, I keep them awake. In the middle of the night is morning for them. They keep asking in the form of those closest with voices, Happy New Year. Is it a question? Is how are you doing? To which I keep answering, one minute despair, the same minute delirium. Are you all out there? It's dark out here. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> there you are. Okay. This is a series of dreams that I had between 2016 and last night, and it's titled, um, as, as is the title of my next book of poetry, Hydra Medusa, or Give Away the One You Want. The circles of words are the dream world distilled. Pupe Misagi, trans relating house one. Last night I dreamt I cheated on a test, then wept. That's Jay Ponteri from Loeb. I had a dream last night that a scream did not need a hill to gather speed to reach the people. I had a dream last night that the war fit on the tip of a finger. I had a dream last night that I was floating face up like a corpse in a coffin, minus the coffin, down a long, low ceilinged hallway, at the far end of which was a large, do large doorway that opened onto a bright green forest filled with dozens of young, round-headed deer, all of them lying on each other asleep. I had a dream last night that death was not called death, it was called expectoration. Upon expectoration, a mask, hard, made of wood, grew over the face, 
the face turned to liquid, the liquid washed through, the, through and flushed out the body. I had a dream last night that lispectorate was a word. It was a verb and meant cough up or spit out, phlegm, sarcasm, laughter, disdain in the manner of Clarice Lee Spector. I had a dream last night that I was watching a River Phoenix biopic starring a young Yo-Yo Ma circa early 1980s. I had a dream last night that a man gave a performance in which he visibly aged. When the performance began, he was young. By the end, he was old. The stage was large, the space for the audience was small, there were no seats. The man walked to the foot of the stage and said in a low voice, my house. I had a dream last night that I met a woman who was made of bricks. She took herself apart brick by brick and became a pile of bricks. I had a dream last night that my teacher was sitting on the edge of the roof of an old building. She had just given us our final exam, which was to speak extemporaneously for 10 minutes on a single subject, any subject. I went last. I closed my eyes and said, Someday the earth will become the moon, beaten, abused, extinguished, and yet indispensably radiant to some other life. But then I stopped. I did not know what else to say. I looked around the room. My classmates were frowning. Then the teacher opened the window. A teacher is someone who instills in others the conviction that no matter how close you get to the edge, you will not fall. I had a dream last night that I visited my friends Yanara and Robert at their apartment in an indeterminate city. It was raining. I took off my jacket and sat at Robert's desk, which was covered in old newspapers and several languages, artifacts and fossils. The ceiling was skylights. The rain tapped a beautiful ode. All the lights were off. It was dark, but with wisps of clouded light, which illuminated the work. Robert showed up. Then Yanara showed up and Yanara said, do you want to drive with me to DC? I can take you right now. No, I said, but okay. I had a dream last night that Lisa and I were visiting a farm. When we arrived, many of the animals were dead. Their bodies, shorn and contorted, were spread out across the decimated fields, which erupted every few seconds with mud. It took us a minute to realize that the farm was being strafed, but the planes or drones maybe were invisible. We ran into a pen and bedded down with the goats. I had a dream last night that my job was to, con to convince a herd of goats to walk in a circle on the side of a snow-covered mountain. One goat refused, the oldest female. She stared at me. I could see in her eyes light from the rising sun shining through smoke on a treeless horizon. I had a dream last night that a rainbow was burning. I had a dream last night that an unsent postcard was crawling with small insects. I had a dream last night that I was in a cult. Cult life consisted of sitting at long cafeteria tables in the ruins of a Japanese American concentration camp and applying lines of whiteout to eight and a half by 11 sheets of sandpaper. Straight lines, vertical. I could not get the whiteout to cooperate. My lines were uneven. They wandered and bled. I was given demerits, then handcuffed and escorted to the edge of the camp. I had a dream last night that my grandfather, upset with me, upset with the book that I had written about him, attacked me. My grandfather was, when he died, very small. He shrunk to less than five feet tall and his arms were even skinnier than mine. But he had the fortification and the force of all our dead behind him. And they too were upset with the book I'd written. So his attack was their attack. I should have given into it because if their attack was sincere, 
And if it satisfied the extent of their being upset, then I would soon be joining them and become part of that force. And yet I tried to escape. I ran into a building. There was a cafeteria. People were eating at long tables. The tables had wheels. My grandfather catching up to me started pushing the tables with the people st still sitting at them. He started pushing the tables into me. I laid down on the floor hoping the tables would pass over. I had in my hands with its spine against my neck the book I had written about him. I had a dream last night that I took my daughter to visit her great grandfather's grave. When we got there, his grave was gone and had been replaced with an obelisk inscribed with the words, Hydra Medusa. My daughter sat down in front of it and closed her eyes. And this is the final dream. I had a dream last night that my grandmother on her deathbed pulled me close to her face and said in a faint, half broken voice, give away the one you want. Thank you. I had a dream last night that the war fit on the tip of the finger. One minute despair, the same minute delirium. In the middle of the night is mourning for them. The fence flew back and forth. They wanted it to be over. The dead were not gazing. A replica of a circumstance. Could feel in my right shoulder something like candy. A long narrow strip of yellow paper. I don't have the time. It was the same poem, so I thought I knew what I was doing. Happy New Year. I can't imagine having a father who would write about me. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you for your words, your vision, your voice. Please continue to show Brandon gratitude in the chat. Our last formal reading for the PNCA Winter Residency will be taking place on Saturday, January 9th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, we will have the voice and reading of Allison Cobb. So please join us this Saturday, January 9th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. We will be logging off, take care, be well, show kindness to yourself and others. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Awesome reading. Yeah, Great. you too. Poupe, awesome. Really a joy to read with you too. Thank you. Thank you. See y'all. Good night. Thank Good you, night. Caitlin. Yeah, thank you so much. Those were all really incredible. I'm glad to have listened. See y'all. Good night. Good night. <laughs>